about you tonight, but I want my life to give him glory and honor and blessing. I want my life to give glory to God. And not only do I want my life to give glory to God, but I want to give him glory. Amen. I said, I want to give him glory. Would you just lift your hands all across this house? We don't, just for a second without any music, can you do that on your own right where you are? Come on, can you just give him the glory and the honor and the power, Lord, the blessing that he deserves? Lord, we, we lift you up tonight, God. Lord, I pray tonight, Lord, let our lives be glorious unto you. Lord, let our lives and the fruit that comes from our lives, Lord, God, today it's an honor, it's a privilege to be able to come into this house, Lord, and to worship you in spirit and in truth tonight. Lord, I pray that our lives, I pray that our actions, I pray that our words would be uplifting to you. I pray that everything done on this property tonight, Lord, would give you glory and honor and praise tonight. Lord, hear the worship of your people in this house tonight, Lord. Hallelujah. Let our worship be as a sweet-smelling Savior into the nostrils of our God tonight, Lord. God, we worship you tonight. We worship you tonight. Hallelujah. We worship. We worship you tonight. Hallelujah. Brother Haskell Grant, you've heard me mention Brother Grant before, and some of you may know Brother Grant passed a few years ago, I believe at the age of 92. And um, Brother Haskell Grant, uh, I, he was a general in my life just like Brother Brinkle. And I know that I mentioned Brother Brankel a lot, a lot. It's not to mention a man, but it's mentioning the God in that man. And Brother Haskell Grant was the same to me. I would go over and just sit with Brother Grant and just listen to him talk. Pre been preaching since he was 17 years old, died at 93. And just sitting, listening, listening to him, boy, it would just make you want to grab a switch and go bear hunting with a switch. But you couldn't talk to Brother Grant very long. and I've noticed the same in Brother Brankel and others. That you couldn't sit on Brother Grant's porch very long. Or we would go to a place there in our hometown called the Donut Hole. Praise God for the Donut Hole. And you couldn't sit there at the table with Brother Grant very long before his preaching and his praise would turn over into action right there in front of you. Didn't matter where we were, Brother Grant would slip his hands up and he'd say, praise God, thank you, Jesus. Praise God, thank you, Jesus. Praise God, thank you, Jesus, Brother Grant. And, and listen, you just had to wait till he was done. <laughs> it was either join in or just wait till he was finished. I want my life to spill over into praise and worship unto the Almighty God for what he has done for me. Amen. He has been far better to us than we deserve. Would you agree with that? Would you give the Lord a hand clap of praise tonight? You may be seated tonight. Thank you for joining us again in this service tonight. And I want to continue tonight from the subject of shift. I've kind of, I guess, loaded both barrels, if you will, on Sunday morning talking to you about contagious Christianity and then on Sunday night talking to you about shift and the fact that I believe God and I have been saying that God is shifting our church but I believe God has already shifted our church. And so tonight I want to continue if you would turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 37 and verse 1 through 14 that is where we will read from tonight. As you are turning to Ezekiel 37, verse 1, I just want to remind all of you, those that plan to go on the four-wheeler ride in the morning, we will leave here at 8 o'clock. If you show up at 10 after 8, you just missed the four-wheeler trip. So we'll leave here at 8 o'clock. We should return around 2. So be here at 8 o'clock. Ezekiel chapter 37. Tonight I want to read to you from there. The Bible said, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. And it was full of dry bones. 
He caused me to pass along or pass among them round about and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley and lo, they were very dry. He said to me, son of man, can these bones live? And I answered and said, O Lord God, only you know. And again, he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you and that you may come to life. And I will put sinews or I will put muscles on you and make flesh grow back on you and cover you with skin and put breath in you that you may come alive and you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a loud noise. And behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, sinews were on them, and flesh grew, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. <clears throat> then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus saith the Lord, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may come to life. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came unto them, and they came to life and stood on their feet an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope has perished. We are completely cut off. Therefore prophesy to them and say to them, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. Then you will come up out of your graves, my people. I will put my spirit within you and you will come to life and I will place you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and done it, declares the Lord Almighty. Lord, help us tonight to hear what thus saith the Lord. Help me tonight, Lord, that the words that would come from my mouth tonight not be my own, but the words that you would have me to speak. Lord, tonight crown this altar service with the presence of God and we'll be sure to give you all the praise and all the glory. And everybody said... God bless you this evening. I believe, and I want to just share tonight and slow down as I did this morning. I know that may be impossible, you think, for me to slow down in preaching. But I believe tonight that if this church is shifting and going to shift, it will be this group right here that will shift. Not the Sunday morning crowd. It'll be the Sunday night crowd. It'll be the Wednesday night crowd where you will see God begin to shift because you are the people that want to experience God. You are the people that want to be in the presence of God. And so I believe that it will be this group where you will see a shift begin or maybe already taking place. Last week, I spoke to you and I asked you a few questions as we started and I'll ask them again tonight. And so please don't answer me tonight out loud. Answer to yourself. This is a personal evaluation. I asked you four questions last week as I began preaching to you about shift. The first question I asked you last week is, do you believe that it's God's will for Van Buren First Assembly to grow? Do you believe that it is the will of God that this church grow beyond where we are today? If you missed last week, please go back and listen to last week's sermon. The second question I asked is, do you believe, first, do you believe that it's God's will for it to grow? But secondly, do you want it to grow? There is a difference in believing that it is the will of God for it to grow, but there is also the fact whether I want it to grow or not. If I believe that it is God's will for it to grow, then I will get involved in its growth in one way or another. The third question I asked last week is, do you believe that you could help your church grow? And number four, I asked, are you willing to do your part to help your church grow? 
Well, we will see those answers become evident in the next days and weeks and a few months ahead. I spoke to you about the fact that God is shifting, has shifted our church. And the, the, the definition of shift means to transfer from one place to another. I want to go back this morning and mention it, mention it again as I did this morning. I'll mention it again tonight. I want to be very clear and you're hearing what I say here is that I am not taking this church another way. I have no intention of building a seeker-friendly church. I have no intention of backing off from our Pentecostal heritage. I am Pentecostal, thoroughly Pentecostal. I won't ever be anything else but Pentecostal. I'm not seeking to be anything else but thoroughly Pentecostal. I want to build on a Pentecostal church and raise an on fire Pentecostal church for the Lord Jesus Christ where the gifts are at work. I said where the gifts are at work in our people, the gifts are at work in our children. We ought to have children prophesying to other children. We ought to have youth prophesying to other youth. We ought to have old men that are dreaming dreams. Come on, somebody. We ought to have older ladies that are speaking into young ladies' lives. And so I'm not taking this church another way. We are moving forward and we are building on what has already been established. And so our community, I said this morning, and I want to I wanna go back to clear this up because someone that may watch or someone that may have just been half listening could have taken this wrong this morning when I said that our community is looking to us. And I believe that our community is looking to us, but when I say that, I mean that I believe the community, this community is looking to the overall church to lead them, to lead them into the way that God would have us to go. I would never want to separate ourselves to say we are the only ones that have it right. I would never want to set us up because we're, I would be setting us up for a place of failure because how many of you know we make mistakes? Boy, some of you don't believe that. Look at your neighbor and say, you make mistakes. If you don't believe me, maybe you'll believe one of them. Turn to the other one and tell them maybe you make mistakes. You've wanted to say it for a long time. Go ahead and say it again. It felt good, didn't it? Just say it a little louder. Come on, just look at him. Some of you wouldn't do it if Jesus asked you to do it. But look at the other one and say, you make mistakes. <laughs> Whew, that felt good, didn't it? I feel a spirit of liberation in the room. I just helped a marriage somewhere, I believe. Some, some, some sir is not going to sleep on the couch tonight. Praise God. I would never want to say... We are it, and everybody else is wrong. But I believe that the community is looking to the church. When I'm out in the community here in Van Buren and I hear what the community has to say, they are looking to the church and this overall community. And I believe that we are able to move this community forward. <laughs> I guess I'm the only one. Malcolm Gladwell opens his book, The Tipping Point, with this story. For hush puppies, the shoes, the classic American brushed suede shoe with a light colored sole, the tipping point came somewhere in late 1994 and early 1995. The brand had been but almost dead until that point. Sales were down to 30,000 pairs of shoes a year mostly to backwoods outlets and small-town family stores. Wolverine, the company that makes the, the shoe Hush Puppies, was thinking of phasing out the shoe that had made them eventually famous. But then something strange happened. At a fashion shoot, two Hush Puppy executives, Owen Baxter and Jeffrey Lewis, ran into a stylist from New York who told them that the classic shoe had suddenly become hip in the clubs and in downtown Manhattan there in New York. He says, we were being told, Baxter recalls, that there were resale shops in the village of, of Shoho, the city of Shoho, where the shoes were being sold. People were going to mom and pop stores and, and the little stores that still carried them and buying them up as fast as they could. 
Baxter and Lewis were baffled at first. It made no sense to them that the shoes were so obviously out of fashion and how could they make a comeback so fast? By the fall of 1995, things began to really happen in a rush. The first designer, John Bartlett, called. He wanted to use hush puppies in his spring collection and then a Manhattan designer called, wanted to use the shoes in her show as well. In Los Angeles, the designer, Joel Fitzgerald, put about a 25-foot inflatable basset hound. Anybody remember that? He put about a 25-foot inflatable basset hound, the symbol of hush puppy, the hush puppy brand, on the roof of his Hollywood store. He gutted an adjoining art gallery to him and turned it into a hush puppy boutique. While he was still painting and putting up shelves, actors left and right and people left and right were walking in his store asking for a pair of these shoes. It was totally word of mouth, he said. In 1995, the company sold 430,000 pairs of the classic shoe. The next year, it sold four times that amount. The year after that, even double that amount until the shoes, Hush Puppy, were once again a famous shoe from the American male and female alike. No one was trying to take hush puppies or no one was trying to make hush puppy, the hush puppy shoe, a trend, yet somehow that's exactly what happened. The shoe passed a certain point in popularity and then they tipped. How does a $30 pair of shoes go from a handful of downtown Manhattan hipsters and designers to every mall in America in the space and time of two years? How does a shoe go from nearly extinction in two years to a number one shoe selling shoe again? Gladwell, the owner of this this book and, and an investor into the shoe company said that it was a tipping point. I preached to you last week for a little while on a tipping point that when a church reaches a tipping point of growth, a church reaches a tipping point of new infusion of life, not to say that this church was dead, don't take me wrong, but there is new life that comes to a place, it reaches a tipping point. Gladwell was interviewed and he said, how how did this shoe, how did this happen? And so I want to preach to you tonight or really talk to you just for a few moments tonight from these three points tonight. Tell us, they said, how did that shoe go from nearly extinction to life again? He said it was three things. One, he said it was contagious behavior. Everyone was interested in the shoe again. Number two, he said it was little changes that had big effects. We still advertised the same. We still did some of the same things. But it was little changes that had big effects. And he said, number three, it was both number one and two. It was both those actions happening in a hurry. He points out that throughout the rest of the book, that a simple shift has the potential to cause a tipping point to occur in any endeavor. Listen to me tonight, not only do we need a tipping point or are we having a tipping point in the church, but you need to have a tipping point in your marriage. I said you need to have a tipping point in your marriage. You need to have a tipping point at home again where relationships are refired. Come on, and you're not just going through emotion again. Come on, somebody. You're not just saying I love you because you have to say I love you. You're not just spending time with your families because you feel like you have to spend time with your family. We need a refire. Firing in marriages and families again today. That's not my sermon tonight, but it's the truth. The book of Ezekiel, I want to go back just for a minute, then I'm going to bring you back to close. The book of Ezekiel is a very difficult book to understand. It has been said that the Jewish rabbi would not allow this book to be read to their young men until they were 30 years of age because they did not want them to look down on the scripture because of Ezekiel being so difficult to understand. It's easier to understand the book if you had a little knowledge of 
the history of Israel. So let me give you a little bit. Israel had a bad habit of obeying God partially. When you go back and you read this book, you will see that Israel had a very difficult time. They had a very bad habit of obeying God partially. Thus, they began to complain about the moving of God. Thus, they began to complain about the new converts in the church. Thus, they began to complain because they were only halfway serving and So, this caused their worship of God to be a struggle. Their habit of halfway obeying God or partially obeying God or partially getting in, it caused their worship to God. It became a struggle. And their relationship with God, it caused it to be strained. Let me tell you tonight before I move on that God wants 100% of your worship. He wants 100% in a relationship. He's not looking for just a thank you, Jesus. He's not looking just for you just because you walked in here tonight and sat down. That That means absolutely nothing to God. It's when it's a sacrifice of praise at times when you would say, Lord, I may not feel like it, but I'm going to worship you anyway. So it caused their relationship with God to be strained. God tells them that if they don't get these things worked out and commit to serve him with their whole hearts, that they will soon be taken into captivity by their enemies. Ezekiel comes on the scene when Israel is taken into captivity by the Babylonians for the second time. And Ezekiel prophesies during one of the most depressed and distressed times in the history of Israel. When we get to chapter 27, Jerusalem has already been destroyed. A refugee that survived the destruction, comes to where Ezekiel is and begins to tell him all that the exiles, all that, it, all that the city has been destroyed. Th- this person, this refugee that survived, he comes to tell Ezekiel the story of, of the decimation and everything that's been destroyed. Listen to me this evening. We're going somewhere. Just hold on. Can you imagine how these people felt? Their town has been destroyed. Their homes have been destroyed. Their relationships have have been destroyed. Their greatest hope was was to return to Jerusalem, but now it's gone. It's totally destroyed. It would be like astronauts on the space shuttle finding out on their return trip to earth that the earth has been destroyed and there's no place to go. There's no home to go to. But here's the good part. The night before this refugee arrives, Ezekiel begins to prophesy a message of hope. In Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 1 through 14 that I've opened. Now, for the sake of time, I'll not go back to read it. But the Lord, the Bible said, the Lord took me, Ezekiel, out and said, look at the valley of these dry bones. He said, what I want you to do, prophet, what I want you to do, child of God, is speak to these dry bones. Many of you may have dry bones in your life. Tonight, your relationships may not be where they ought to be. Your relationship with God may not be where it ought to be. But I challenge you tonight to stand up and begin to prophesy over your situation. The Bible said that the power of life and death is in your mouth, it's your tongue. You can prophesy over yourself tonight. You don't need the preacher to lay his hands on you. You can lay your hand on yourself and speak a blessing right there, right where you are over yourself. Oh, preacher, how ridiculous would that be? Hey, there's been times I, well, there's been a lot of times, there's been a lot of times I couldn't get to folks to pray for me. There's a lot of times, listen, let's just be honest, I didn't want anybody praying for me. I was was going through such a difficult time and a difficult place. If I couldn't do my own praying, I didn't want anybody else to pray. There's been times even since I've been at this church, I've sat in that room right out there. I call it, this this will offend some of you, but I'm sorry. The room right out here to the left in the hallway, I call it the devil room. It's the devil room because that's where y'all put me for 45 minutes while you was in here voting on me. I wore the carpet out in that room that night. I was walking back and forth. I'm afraid to even open that door right now. 
I'm not. I'll go in there. I know some of you don't like that, but I walk in there. That's my prayer room. Every day of the week I walk and I sit down in that room and there I turn on the light. That's where I meet with God in that room right there. I have run. We've run the devil for sure out of that room. I said we've run, but I've sat in that room and laid my hand on my forehead and said in the name of Jesus, uh, no matter what come hell or high water, we're moving forward. No matter if I take 10 people with me or if I take 100 people with me, I'm not. (laughs) Sometimes you've just got to lay your hands on yourself. The Lord, when he told Ezekiel to stand and speak to these dry bones, it certainly looked like an impossibility. Had you been there, sir, you would have thrown water on the fire and said to Ezekiel, what are you doing? What are you praying? The Bible said right there in the scripture I just read to you that they were very dry. You ever seen very dry bones that have had bleached out and they're white and they're cracked they're, because they're so old? They've been outside. I'm sure that's what these bones look like. And had you been standing there that day, you would have said to Ezekiel, Son, what on earth are you doing? But God has spoken to, who well, God had spoken to Ezekiel and said, These dry bones can live. God didn't ask him because God didn't didn't know. God asked Ezekiel because he wanted him to know. Listen to me. God knows the future of this church. He knows what's coming tomorrow. He knows what's coming in your life. But it's it's for you to stand up and say, thus saith the Lord. That may seem to be impossible. It may be impossible to put somebody in every pew in this church. You may think so, but I believe that it is possible. You have a lot of people that will kill the dreams in your life. Be careful who you tell your dreams. Be careful who you share your vision. I have to be careful with what I'm doing here. Because there's there's folks sitting ready to sit there and say, you can't do that. You've come too late to do that. You're too young to do that. You're not smart enough to do that. I give you credit and say, yes, you're right for all of those, but I'm anointed to do it, and I can go fur- you can go further. I said, you can go further with the anointing than you can with any of the rest of those things. The Lord said to Ezekiel, stand up and prophesy. Stand up and say something. Had we been standing there, and this isn't my sermon, but it feels good right here, so I'm going to stay here for a minute. <laughs> Had we been standing there that day in the valley of dry bones, I'm sure we would have walked off to go to Wendy's. We would have wanted to go to another church. This man's lost his ever-loving mind. Reach the community. See the lost come. God said through the prophet Ezekiel that he's going to bring about a shift. He said, sir, if you'll stand and just do what I say, say what I say, do what I say to do. If you'll just stand, I'm going to show you a shift that you've never seen before. And not only will these people live again, he said, but they'll also fulfill God's purpose. God said in the scripture there, he said, I'll open your graves. He said, I'll bring you out. He said, I will breathe my spirit into you. I will come. You will come to life and I will place you in your own land. So let me give you tonight just a bit of vision for this church and we're going to get on to shift. If you're taking notes, write down an S on your notes. Tonight, I believe that God is shifting our church. I believe he's already shifted our church. Gladwell said in his book, The Tipping Point, what was the result of the three things? I just read it to you, just said it to you, that caused these shoes to come back to popularity again and caused them to thrive. And he said, number one, it was contagious behavior. Number two, it was little changes that had big effects. And he said both of those things happened in a hurry. Listen to me this evening. God God takes his time putting things in order. Can you say amen? God takes his own sweet time putting things in order. Come on. I think it's okay to say this without getting in trouble. (laughs) Maybe. But sometimes I would just like to say to the Lord, could you not have... 
done this a little faster. <laughs> did, did we really, really have to go through all of this? Was all of that really necessary? And I have found out that in God's will and God's plan, all of it is necessary to get you and me to where he wants us. God takes his time in putting things together. But when he gets it in place, he moves at lightning speed. God said to the people in John chapter 4, verse 35, he said, prepare, he said, prepare the people for the harvest that I'm sending, for it is soon to come. In fact, let me read it to you. John 4, 35, the Bible said, you may say that there's still four months until harvest time, but I tell you, look, and you will see the fields are ripe and ready to harvest. I preached this to you last week, but some of you weren't here. Let me say it again. He said, you may say that there's still four months to harvest time. You may say that we are moving the church forward. You may say that we're shifting, but I see it another way. I don't see it that way. The Lord said, but I tell you, look and see that the fields are ready. Listen to me. They're everywhere you go. Everywhere you go in this town, every car you drive by, people are begging to hear. People are begging to hear the truth they want. Jesus said to him, he said, you think it's not time, but I'm telling you it is time. Amen. This is the shift strategy that I believe God has given us for this church. What's it going to take for us to experience a lift or a shift in our church to a new level? Let me give it to you. Ephesians chapter 4 verse, I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4 through 7 the Bible said, but God being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he hath loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, has made us alive together with Christ and raised us up with him and seated and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. That word seated in Ephesians chapter 2 there, that word seated means a place in which something belongs, a place in which something occurs, or a place in which something is established. God has set us in a place that belongs to him. I said, God has seated us into a place that belongs to him. Well, I'm not sure about that. I don't like the music. I don't like this. I don't like that. Let me ask you, in all of those things, have we ever asked God what he likes? I don't like this, and I don't like that, and I don't like this, and I'm going somewhere. Have we ever just stopped to say, Lord, do you like that? He seated us. We are in a place tonight. I am in a place tonight. This isn't my church. It's his church. We're in a place tonight. He seated us, seated us in a place that belongs to him. So tonight, let me talk to you just for a moment. And I will go down through shift. And so tonight, the first, I believe, the first place that is going to lift our church. And tonight, I'm just talking to you. We'll come back to running and hollering and jumping pews and all that stuff maybe later on. I'm not sure. Tonight, in order for God to shift our church, we must be spiritual people. I said we must be spiritual people. I didn't say religious people. I didn't say people of religion. I said we must be spiritual people. Religiosity will get you nowhere. I'm working on a sermon right now, and I'm about halfway through it, and I, I've really been writing it for months. How many of you know sometimes sermons, do they have to cook and cook? <laughs> well, maybe. And so you get an idea, and you write a little, and then you, then you run out, and you come back. and then you, So I'm, I'm working on a sermon right now. The killer of the spirit is a religious spirit. And I'm going to preach that sermon off of a treadmill right here in front of you on this platform. So don't think that I'm trying to blaspheme the Holy Ghost when I preach that. But having a spirit of religiosity is like walking on a treadmill. 
you're doing something, but you're not going anywhere. It appears that it's helping you, and it appears that you're doing the right thing, but you're on a treadmill, you're just standing there walking. You're doing the right, it appears you're doing the right thing, but you're not going anywhere. We must be people of the Spirit. Let me give you the scripture. Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 4 through 5. I'm going to give you several scriptures here, in fact. Ezekiel 37, verse 4 through 5. And again, he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, to say to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you that you may come to life. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, the Bible said, Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, You shall have no other gods before me. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, And he said unto them, You shall love the Lord God with all your heart and with all your your soul and with all your mind. Matthew 22 verse 37 and he said to them you shall love the God lo the Lord God with all your heart with all your soul and with all your mind. Matthew chapter 12 verse 2 and do not be conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is the perfect will of God that which is good and acceptable and perfect. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 23 now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely and may your spirit, soul, and body be preserved completely without blame at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 2 verse 2 through 4 I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men and you have put to test those who call themselves apostles and they are not and you have found them to be false and they have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary but I have this against you that you have left your first love. We are to be spiritual people. We are people of the Spirit. Let me give you this evening four steps to a healthy spiritual life. I understand, Pastor, I, we are to be spiritual. And, and you may think tonight, I, this is very basic. I don't need this. We're helping some. We may not be helping you. But tonight I want to give you four steps to a spiritual healthy life. And four steps that I believe is going to help take this church to, a ne to the next level. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 15. I want to talk to you just for a moment about spiritual disciplines. <laughs> well, that's a bad word, right? Discipline. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 15 through 19. For this reason I too having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you and your love for all the saints. Do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of glory may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of strength, of the strength of his mind. Today, tonight, if we're going to see a shift in our church, and tonight I'm just talking to you. I'm just talking to you about each individual. I'm talking to you about us. Tonight, there are three areas of focus that I'm challenging this church as we are shifting to move forward. And I understand tonight that we're not jumping pews. And I understand tonight that we're not, we're not running all over the place. But listen, I believe that God is moving us and he's speaking to us about where Number one tonight, I want to challenge you in three, in three areas. First of all, tonight to be people of devotions. Let me ask you a question, and I, please don't answer me. But do you have a regular time daily that you spend with God? Do you have a time, a time of devotion? Well, I don't have time. Well, it's time to start making time. We have time for Oprah. We got time for Dr. Phil. We got time for as the world turns. We got time for the young and the restless. We got time for Starbucks. What else is on the list here? Y'all help me. 
We have time for everything else. Pastor, my day is crammed. My day is full. Let me tell you, if there's going to be a shift in the church and a shift in your life, you must be a student of the Word of God. I say to you, get up 15 minutes earlier. Stay up 15 minutes later. Put your phone down. Most of us, before we ever get out of bed, we've already found out what everybody else is doing. We have Facebooked getting up out of bed. Who cares? <laughs> Just brush my teeth. Praise God. We don't care. Just poured myself a cup of coffee. Who cares? We can't do anything anymore without telling the world what we're doing. You ever just want to, you don't want anybody to know what you're doing. Come on, not that you're hiding anything. I said to somebody the other day, don't you remember a time when we had to search for a payphone? Y'all know what a payphone is? You'd be hard pressed to find a payphone. When we didn't have when we didn't have cell phones at the palm of your hand, you can go around the world right there where you're sitting. Some of you are on it right now. <laughs> Some of you are in another world right now. We didn't have the world in the palm of our hand. We had to pull over. Anybody remember a beeper? How many of you have one right now? Come on, don't be ashamed. That beeper would go off and you'd have to stop and find a payphone to call somebody. Then we got to the bag phone. How many of you thought you were really cool when you had that bag phone? Oh, yeah, yeah, you did. Some of you wouldn't raise your hand. Us. Then you walked around with that brick. Hold on, let me get somewhere higher where I can talk to you. Anybody, you remember the party line at home? Oh, yeah, I got four sisters. I remember it. Anybody remember a record player? Eight track? Cassette? How many of you still have a record player at your house? Wow. How many of you still have an eight track player? Lord, y'all need to catch up with the rest of us. <laughs> I don't know how we got off on this. <laughs> we should be people of devotion. Put the phone down. Turn the TV off. Pray with your kids at night before they go to bed. Pray with your wife. Pray with your husband. Pray for your pastor by all means if you don't do anything else. I'm challenging you tonight, and, and we're going we're gonna to follow up on this. It's just not a challenge that I'm just going to speak about it, and we're going to leave it alone. We're coming back. But I challenge you that you would have, in order to help move our church forward, we must be spiritual people, and in order to be spiritual people, we must be students of the Word of God. I'm going to ask you tonight that you would be people of prayer. In fact, I'm going to go further tonight and to ask you, these are challenges that I'm asking you to help us move this church forward. You'll see why I'm asking you all of this in just a moment. I'm going to ask you to be people of prayer. Pastor, we are people of prayer. I understand and I appreciate that and I really do believe that. But I'm asking tonight who would give one hour of their week to pray for this church. If we had 50 people that would say, I'll pray one hour a day for this church this week, just one hour this week. If we had 50 hours of prayer for this church alone, not for paying your bills, not to get a new car, not to get a new house, but one hour, 50 people that would pray one hour this week for this church, I'll guarantee you, you'll see a difference in this church. I know this is basic. I'll, be, I'll move on in just a second. If we had 50 people that would just lift up this church, if we had 50 people that would pray one hour a week in order for this church to shift, to say, I'll pray for the staff, I'll pray for the children's ministry, I'll pray for the youth, I'll pray, I'll pray for Pastor Gary, I'll pray, I might even pray for my pastor. I'll pray that God will change my heart. I'll pray God will send revival. There's no telling what God would do in this church if people would go back to a time of prayer. Third, I'm going to ask you, and then I'll move on here. 
I'm going to ask you these three areas of focus, devotion, prayer, and number three, to worship. Throughout this series of shift that I'm going to be preaching, we're going to, I'm going to be challenging you as a church that we're going to see the first four questions I asked you in this series. If you really want to go forward, we're going to see. But number, number three, I want to ask you that we are a church of worship. And what I mean by that, what I mean by worship, I believe that we have a worshipful church. I believe that we do come here. Listen, I've preached in a lot of churches around, and Brother Brankel has and some of the rest of you have, where it's like when it comes to the worship service, it's like pulling a log truck with you. That, that singer, that guy that's up there leading, he's sweating. Not, I'm not talking about you tonight. But he's sweating. He's, doing, he's gone through every song he knows in the book to try to get people just to clap their hands. And when it comes time for the preaching, it feels like you're having to raise the dead. But I don't believe in the, that that's the case in this church. We are a worshipful church. I said we are a worshipful church and we believe entering into the holies of holies and the courts of praise. But what I'm asking you tonight is to make a commitment. And listen, I understand you're here tonight. And I understand that some of you come on Wednesday night. But what I'm talking to you about your worship, I'm asking that you would make a commitment to this church for one year that you would attend every worship service you can or at least 90% of the worship services throughout a year. That means you're committing to be here 47 out of the 52 weeks. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to go. Pastor, I'm coming. I know you're here tonight, but I'm talking about stepping up our commitment. I'm talking about that you would commit to being here when you can be here. I understand people are on vacation. You can look around and see that. I'm going to go on one myself in a few weeks. And I know that you're going to as well. But I'm talking about when you can be here that you would be here. Listen, every time that you can be here and you're not here, that's a vote to close the building down. Every time that we're having service and you can be here and you're not here, you're voting to lock the doors. I'm asking that this church, and I, again, I understand you're here tonight, but I'm talking about shifting. I'm talking about moving forward. Four steps to a healthy spiritual life, a healthy spiritual church. One is just what I've just explained, spiritual disciplines, which means we are people that produce. Number two tonight, we are to be spiritual people. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through 25 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. If we are spiritual people, then we are people of compassion, we are people of forgiveness, and we are disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. If I'm going to be a spiritual person, then I am a person of compassion. If you are a spiritual person, it is very hard to walk past someone that has a need. I was very excited this morning that when we came down to the prayer time for folks around the altar, I don't know if you noticed it, but I noticed it immediately. These pews, these altars here, every one of them, all four of them were completely full, and it was full of people mostly that I had never seen here before. This may just be a waste of time preaching this. I didn't hardly know any of these people. Walking down, praying for them. And the further along I went, I thought, praise God, I don't know them. Praise God, I don't know them. Praise God, I don't, know, I don't even know this person. Praise God. We are people of compassion. And listen to me, when you become people of compassion and we begin to reach out, we reach out through burgers and badges. We reach out through Easter. We reach out through search and rescue. And we are people of compassion. God's face shines on people of compassion. And he will send people from the north, the south, the east, and the west because they know and believe. Come on, there were people here visiting this morning. One couple came up and said, I felt so comfortable in your church today to come forward at, a, at the prayer time for somebody to pray for me. Man, that just makes a pastor's head explode. 
Because people that, 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 that aren't used to it. Listen, there's not glass doors. They can't see in here before they get in here. Yeah. Come on, they don't know if they like you or they don't like you or like me. They don't, they don't see us. So it's a risk for them to come in. And the, fa- the couple came to me and said, I felt so comfortable today in your church. I felt the Spirit of God moving in your church. I was so comfortable to come down and let somebody pray for me. That's the spirit of compassion. Come on, I don't know if this is helping you or not. We must be people of forgiveness. I've preached on forgiveness here till I don't know what's left to preach on about it. But if we're going to be spiritual people, we must be people of forgiveness. Well, pastor, I can't help it. I just hold a grudge. Well, we have to be, have spiritual disciplines. Number two, we have to be spiritual people or we are people who God uses us. Number three, there must be spiritual gifts in order to shift. There has to be spiritual gifts at work. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Let me read it again. As each one. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, as each one. One has received a special gift. Employ it or use it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Here, it has been our heart in the staff meetings for the past several weeks, and I did it today. I went home this afternoon as everyone was was napping. And I eventually did for a little bit. But I laid there on the couch, I tried to find a quiet spot. And I found a quiet spot and as I laid there, before I, before I tried to take a nap, I started researching in my mind, who wasn't here today? Because I'm doing a whole lot more than just up here preaching. I'm taking pictures of who's not here. And, and, and some of you have messed me up tonight because you're not sitting where you normally sit. And so, so forgive me if I call you after service and say I didn't see you or something and you were here. But this afternoon I laid on my couch. I was laying there and I just started through my mind from section to section to section of people I couldn't see. And I just started texting them. I missed you today. Didn't see you today. And some, was, some were here. They were just in a different spot and I didn't see them. And, and, and that was okay. And there were some that weren't here, and they would respond back and say, Pastor, thank you so much that you recognized I wasn't there today. Thank you that, now I didn't get to everybody, and I'm going to miss folks, but I'm, I'm trying to get better. But here's what I need from you to help me do. And I talked to the, I'm just talking to you, I'm just talking to you through shift. We'll get back to preaching later. God's moving our church, so I'm trying to help us here loading both barrels, contagious Christianity and shift with what we've got to do to reach God's people. And I've been telling the staff for weeks, we talk and we have staff meetings and we sit and one of the first things we start down through the list, did you see so and so, did you see so and so, did you see so, if you didn't, let's call them, let's check on them, let's email them, let's Facebook them, let's text them, let's see, let's see where they are. I call that walking the fence. I said to the staff last week, I believe it was, we just sat in a staff meeting for almost three hours and all we did, all I did was talk to them about walking the fence. In Houston where I had my cows and horses, I had 50 acres and and probably once, if not once a week, mostly twice a week, but certainly once a week. When I would go out to feed the cows and feed my horses, I would walk that entire 50 acres on that fence. There were no more footprints on that property, nobody else's footprints other than the cows, than mine. Because I was walking that fence. I wanted to make sure of the things, that there weren't things getting in and there weren't things getting out. You could walk that fence literally when I owned that property and you could walk that fence and my footprints were all over that fence row. I was walking that fence looking for holes. I know, I know this may be boring to some of you, but I would walk that fence looking for holes in the fence or looking where brads had popped off the, popped off the post where the fence has come loose and because I have a vested interest in what's inside the fence. 
I have invested in what's inside the fence. I don't want something getting in and I don't want anything getting out. Let me tell you, there were lots of times walking that fence that I was able to find problems and issues. And listen, when I saw problems and issues, I didn't just keep walking past the problems and issues because it's the farmer's responsibility to take care of his vested interest on the inside of the fence. And so I would go back and get tools. I would go back and get the necessities to fix that spot in the fence so I, my vested interest didn't bust out of the place. What I need from you and what I need from the staff is if we're going to grow this church, I need you helping me to walk the fence of this church. When you see somebody that's not here, text them. When you see somebody that, that you, you didn't see, I didn't see so-and-so, text them. Don't do it during church. <laughs> Make a list. Text them. Help us. We are doing the best we can. But if we're going to shift and move forward, we all have to walk that fence. We all have to walk the fence for the things that may be getting in. I was out there feeding my cows one day, feeding the cows just like I normally do. I walk out there and, and, and had a roll of hay in the back of my truck, and here comes everybody. I got more sermons out there out of that bunch than, any, than I have gotten most anywhere else. And preached to them. I, those cows, they got saved every, every day I went out there, I think. But it was because I had food. And, and so I pull up out there one day, and I, I roll that big roll of hay out of the back of my truck. Everybody's there. They're all eating. Here comes the horses. They're eating. And, and standing right there, while I'm standing there, I look around. I'm counting everybody. They're all there. And here comes another somebody. He doesn't look like the rest because I raise longhorns. He's a big, beautiful limousine. I thought, wow. Thank you, Jesus. And he's a bull. And I got all girls. Well, man, have you ever seen a longhorn and a limousine mix? It's as big as your truck. But it wasn't long somebody come to claim him because he wasn't mine. Somebody got in. I need you helping me walk the fence of this church. I release you to help me walk the fence of this church. If you see somebody that's not here, call them. Help us to walk this fence. This is the shifting of our church. And we're caring about those that are here and those that are not here. And we must do that if we're going to move forward. We as a staff, I'm just sharing vision with you. I'm almost done. We as a staff have been talking about the fact that, that we want to start, and you'll be hearing about this ministry coming, coming in the near future that we're calling 3D. And 3D is to discover, to develop, and to deploy. We're going to help you discover your gift. We're going to help you develop that gift. And we're going to deploy you to do, to exercise that gift. It's not, <laughs> it's my job to do the preaching. I'll let staff do the preaching. They can preach just as good as I can preach. We have wonderful, capable people here that can preach, but we don't have to do all of it. We're going to release the people to do, to develop their gift, to, to, to discover their gift, and to deploy you to do what your gift is. Four steps to spiritual health. Spiritual discipline, spiritual people, spiritual gifts, and number four, spiritual things. John chapter 14, verse 12 through 14, the scripture said, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. Who, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me in my name, I will do it. When you read that scripture, and I'll pick it up here next week. Starting to close, I am closing. We'll pick it up here next week. Spiritual things, you go back and you read in this scripture that I just read to you. There's a walk, there's a witness, and there's a work. We have a walk with Jesus Christ that each of us are responsible for. I shared that with you this morning. Each of us, the Bible said in Revelations, and the books were open. 
All of us have a walk that we will be held accountable for. How is your walk with the Lord tonight? I know that we're the Sunday evening crowd, and that's wonderful, and I appreciate your faithfulness, but how's your walk with God? Nobody knows that better than you do. How is your witness of the Lord? We're talking about that on Sunday mornings. And How is your work for the Lord Jesus Christ going? What will all of this accomplish, Pastor? I'm a little bored tonight. We don't normally, this isn't normally what we do, so I'm a little bored, so you need to help me understand what shift will accomplish and what are you trying to accomplish by preaching this what's your angle you know everybody always think the preacher's got some kind of angle my angle my goal is to build the kingdom of God and to see you used us used in doing that that's my angle that's my goal what will all of this accomplish what will me reading my Bible for 15 more minutes a day what will that accomplish what will, what will me pray an hour a week for this church? What will that accomplish, preacher? What will, what will me telling you that I'm going to be here in every church service I can, what will that accomplish? Well, what that will accomplish is change lives. I said what that will accomplish is changed lives. And if you're looking around, we need a whole lot of lives changed not only in the church but outside of the church. The gentleman that had the accident in my front yard yesterday. He's not living a life like you and I are. He needs a changed life. And he deserves, listen, he deserves the same opportunity to have that changed life that you and I have had. That's what it's going to accomplish. Well, pastor, I'm not sure we want all that in here. Therein lies the problem. What will all of this shift? You know, I really don't see a need for it. We're, we're doing fine just as we are, preacher. All you got to do is just keep preaching. Just preach. That's all we want you to do. We don't want to hear a challenge. You know, a lot of us don't like to be challenged. Let's be honest. Come on, I, li I like a good challenge. I like for somebody to tell me I can't. <laughs> I'm going to find a way to do it. But I'm talking about a challenge in a way that affects my everyday living. We don't like that. I wish I would have done it. I didn't have time today, but I'll have it for you next week. And you may beat me to it. And if you do, then wonderful. Wonderful. But I said to you this morning in the service, and I'll have the exact numbers for you this coming Sunday, that in this church alone, to your own admission and your own survey that you filled out, over 10,000 years of service to God represented in that survey of this church. A lot of people didn't fill it out. I don't know why you didn't fill it out. I don't, I don't know, but you didn't. But a lot of people did. So 10,000 years, over 10,000 years that I added up, it takes this church one solid year to get 14.5 people saved. 14 people saved in a year. That's to our inviting. That's to our own individual inviting. That's to what you answered on that survey. It takes this church 14 years to get, I'm one year, I'm sorry, one year to get 14 people saved. Praise God that we have outreaches that are bringing people. Come on, I'm just talking to you. Praise God we have outreaches. Praise God, people will come because it's taking us one year to get 14 people. I'll have the numbers for you next week, but I'll guarantee you ISIS has recruited more since we've been sitting right here than at our own admission we could get in five years. They've gained more today, right now, since you've been sitting right here. 
than what we can gain. That's what it will accomplish. That's what shifting will accomplish is more people coming and recognizing and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Come on, I don't feel like this is going well in here at all. But that's not going to stop me from preaching it. And I know there will be people who walk right out of here and will never do anything we're talking about. But that's not going to keep me from preaching it. It's not going to keep me from ruffling a little feathers. It's not going to keep me from making you feel uncomfortable. Somebody told me this morning, said, Pastor, you've made me feel awful uncomfortable. I said, good, see you tonight. And they're here. Pastor, I don't like hearing that it's my responsibility to get, if that's what it takes, and me making you a little uncomfortable for us to realize that our sole responsibility is to bring somebody to the foot of cross, then I'm willing to get sucker punched every once in a while for you to be uncomfortable. That's what it will accomplish. That's what it will accomplish. Is reaching the lost. And somebody coming to Jesus. Last week, I won't call their name because I don't have their permission. Last week, I preached the first set of contagious Christianity and shift. A family in the church sent me a text on Monday afternoon and said, Pastor, you so convicted me that I've been out knocking on doors all afternoon. Finding people that I haven't seen in church, in our church for years. I've been knocking on their door all afternoon, all day today, trying to get them back to church. Man, when I got that text, I like to run jumped off the cliff in my backyard. And it's a long way. Not to hurt myself, but just for joy. Somebody got it. Somebody got it. Somebody heard Somebody let the Holy Spirit convict them. Somebody realized, hey, he might just be right. He's young and he hasn't been here for umpteen years, but he might just be right. He might have it right. We have it right when we say that our heart beat and the heartbeat of God is souls, is souls, is souls. His souls, souls that don't look like you, souls that don't smell like you, souls that don't act like you, souls that don't dress like you do, souls that don't live in houses like you live in, souls that don't wear clothes like you wear, souls that don't, souls that don't fix their hair or have any hair like you, souls that don't act like or, or live like you do, or, or souls. ISIS doesn't care what they look like. They don't care what they smell like. They don't care where they come from. As long as they will kill you, that's all they want. But we put so many stipulations. Oh, we can't have them. They stink. They don't look like we do. They haven't been here as long as we've been here. They don't. They don't talk our language. They don't. They don't. They don't. They don't. They don't. And tonight, they're busting hell wide open. Because we've held them. Listen, I'm going to be honest. I'm done right here, I promise. I lived in the world for a number of years backslid through some events in my life I was backslid and let me just tell you I'm going to be honest and I don't mean this of this church because I preached in a lot of churches and I don't believe it's the case in this church we're going to talk about the next one H is hospitality I've never heard a sermon preached on hospitality but I'll preach one to you when I was I was raised in church Malvern Assembly of God first Assembly of God church ever in the history of the Assemblies of God I was raised in that church we went to church whether we wanted to go or not. Sick was an excuse. She dragged you out of bed. The old ladies prayed for you. Death didn't keep you. It doesn't matter. I'm, she's taking you going to church. 
You may be under a pew snoring through the whole sermon, but you're going to get to church. Backslid for a period of time. And let me just be honest with you. I was more welcomed into places out there than I was in here. That didn't go good. Worldly folks accepted me and wanted me more than the church folks ever did. I lived in a town of 10,000. Everybody knew who I was. Been in that town all my life. Owned a convenience store in that town. Everybody knew who I was. And the church rejected me more. Man, the world just take you in just like that. Just like that. Because they don't point their finger. And I understand, I'm not, come on, I'm not ignorant. I'm not trying to uplift the world. I'm trying to make a point. They didn't want me. The world would accept me. But you know what? And this is the God's honest truth. I owned a convenience store in that town where I was raised. A dry county. And I sold everything in my store that you'd ever want to buy. And I had as many of the church people buying from me as I did the world. But they wouldn't take me. But they'd go to church and hold up their standard, their religiosity. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? There's people that have driven by since you and I have been sitting here. Driven by on this road right out here since we've been sitting right here. That deserve as much of God as you and I have tonight. And it's our responsibility to make them feel welcome in this house. Can you say amen? So I believe that's our heart. That's our heart. But we have to begin to show it. I'm slowing down on purpose. I, this is not normally my speed. You've heard me for six months. This isn't normally my, my, my avenue to go. I'm, a, I'm more evangelistic in my preaching style than I am anything. But I have felt so impressed that we have to become more of a soul winning church in these last days. That I'm willing to change my way of doing. And I'm willing to be criticized. And I'm willing to be whatever it takes for that person to text me on Monday morning, Pastor. You so convicted me, I've been knocking on doors all day long. Pastor, that sermon so convicted me that I've been looking for souls all day. You punch me in the face and do whatever you want to talk about me, you can do whatever you want to do. But that isn't going to stop me from preaching Jesus is coming and there's more room at the cross. Would you stand all over this house? Hallelujah. Just pray, church, for a minute, would you? Come on, just pray. Forget about who's standing beside you. Come on, would you just pray for a minute? Let the Lord talk to you where you are just for a minute. Would you do it? Come on, church, pray, pray. Let the Lord talk to you. Come on, I believe the Lord right now just wants to hear from us. We're, we're, we're going to wait a minute. Just pray. I believe the Lord wants to hear from you tonight.